that is facilitating this seminar for you today. Uh, I'm here to give you a short introduction about our first keynote speaker, Dr. Vanessa Aguilar. Dr. Vanessa holds the Canada Chair in Grade Inequality and Global Change at the Department of Educational Studies at the University of British Columbia in Canada. She has extensive experience working across the sector in international context, in areas of education related to justice, community engagement, and internationalization. Her work opens decolonial possibilities for addressing ethnocentric and paternalistic relationships in local and global engagement. The research focuses on the analysis of historic and systemic patterns of inequality and how these mobilize global imaginaries that limit or enable different possibilities for coexistence. Dr. Vanessa has published extensively on those topics. Um, she's here present with us today to talk, uh, to give us a, a talk titled Decolonial Possibilities. Education, navigating political and existential challenges, which is very relevant to our seminar today. Um, Dr. Vanessa's talk will be followed by a 10 minute question and answer session. So I would very much encourage you to please jot down your ideas, your thoughts, your questions, and Dr. Vanessa will answer them in the last 10 uh, minutes after her speech. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Vanessa and Manel, thank you for the introduction and thank you to your team for facilitating. Thank you to the conference, thank you to and Fatima and Deborah for inviting me here. I think the protocol that I've been taught is to acknowledge first the land as a nation being, all the um, voluntary and involuntary sacrifices that have been made by many people, most of which we don't know for us to be here, and acknowledge all of you as my relatives. So you will see, I don't know, can we put it in? Yeah, thank you. The picture um, that you see on the screen um, is also part of my introduction. I'm from a family of German and indigenous ancestry. I was born in Brazil in the middle of two cultures in conflict that are part of the colonial history that uh, Fatima has, uh, has told us about in the beginning. And by marriage and interconnection, I have been led to be in contact with some other communities where I have mentors. And one of these mentors gave me the name, which is depicted in the picture. And when there are naming ceremonies uh, now that I've been to some, there's always a lot of anticipation because what you were told is that you will have to grow into your name. And according to the elders, they know better who you are than you do yourself. Generally, you push back against the work that you need to do. So I was thinking, please dream of something happening <laughs> that, like, that who dances in the forest, something like that. But it's what was ranked for me was uh, that my name would be the first star of the evening, that which announces the night. And I said, ah, this is nothing for me. It's very nice. Okay, easy to do. But it actually, um, reflects a lot of the things that I've been doing, being in between places, in between day and night, in between cultures, in between communities, doing a lot of translation and serving uh, a lot of different communities that generally don't meet and don't talk to each other. And this work is very fragile, and sometimes it's quite hard to do, uh, and I'm learning. So if I make mistakes today, they're mine, and I probably will have to report it to other people and be accountable for them. But this failure, these mistakes are part of the journey, a part of uh, the way that we have to discover what we can do and who we are. And what we can do is just a little bit, but in conjunction with what everybody else can do, it may create the movement that you're talking about. It also taught me that uh, to a certain extent, you cannot help but be who you are. And there's a saying actually in Maori culture that like, when the tiny part serves, you cannot but uh, be who you are. So when the water spirit turns, 
whatever it is that you came here to do will come out. So there's no uh, use masking it. Um, it you have to offer it with love and compassion, which you want to teach. And that's, I think, the journey that I'm learning uh, to do and I'm reflecting on. So any feedback that you have on how I'm doing it is very well. What I'm going to share with you today are a few questions that are related to the paper that was um, sent to all of us in the beginning about ethics. Then um, a few frames uh, of the work that I've done in the past in relation to inclusion, to global change, and to uh, the dominant global imaginary that is colonized imaginary we're talking about. And if we have time, I'll share a story with you that is also part of uh, of my work moving towards both experiential learning of these things and uh, metaphorical story ways of dealing with these issues that are lighter than dealing with this through logic, right? So that may take us to a different kind of walking together. So these are the seven questions that have uh, been very present in my life, but for a long time. It's not, these are not research questions, these are questions that I've been interested in for, uh, for a very long time, and I don't have uh, complete answers, I have only provisional answers to some of them, and they bug you, and they poke you, and whatever happens that's challenging in the encounters with these different communities, I go back to them to, uh, to think, and to try to deepen uh, my experience of them, both the meaningful experience and the physical experience that involves the body and beyond. So the first question is, how can we hospice a dying way of knowing and being and assist with the birth of something new, too fragile, undefined, and potentially, but not necessarily, wider? So how do we do that through education and whatever way you define education? How do we deal with something that is dying and that you can't kill, <laughs> something that uh, is completing its cycle, and at that stage of when something is dying, there's a lot of palliative care that needs to be gifted to it. And palliative care is not very glamorous. It involves a lot of diarrhea and vomiting, right? It's a lot of cleaning up work. Um, but it also involves uh, the demand for presence, for presence to a death, where the stories can be told, where actually we have the the necessity to sit down with that death, and it's not a death that is only happening outside of us, it's happening within us. Sit with that death and learn stories about what has been going on so that we can learn from the mistakes already made in order to make only different mistakes in the future. Now, the process of birth is also something that is very interesting because as a midwife, and I'm not a midwife, but I've been talking to midwives now to try to get if I get it, uh, it's about preparing the way for this baby who you cannot decide is going to be a girl, boy, or a queer baby, right? Uh, for for this, this person to come into the world and for the family to be well, right? For the whole family. Your, um, your um, commitment is not just to the baby, it's to the family that brought it into being. And we, if we're thinking about the families we have today, it may be a family that is suffering domestic violence, for example. So how do we think about this birth in a way that we become responsible for the well-being of the whole family, and at the same time, we don't over-determine who this baby is? Um, and I'm also very interested in the role of both anger and love in this process, and where anger and love have their place in, bringing, in, in being in this middle. I've also thought about it as a storm. So we are between hospicing and midwife brain, there is a storm, and there is the middle of the storm, right there in that middle. If you walk too fast, you get caught in the storm. If you walk too slow, you get caught in the storm. You have to be walking at the eye of the storm uh, as these changes are happening. So it's all very metaphorical, but it's, if you want, to can give you the, the, the real uh, examples with, uh, with contextual knowledge as well. The second question that I have is how can we tap the possibilities that are viable but unintelligible within the dominant system? How to invite people to consider what's <coughs> impossible? So this is coming from the idea that we talk about hope, 
we talk about um, the future generally from a very uh, established idea of what we want to see. So, for example, when people talk about change, and this is across communities, what I've noticed is that it's like we want to change of clothes, uh, something more comfortable, something more fashionable, something that will make me look good or feel good in the skin. We're not talking about tearing the clothes down and getting naked and sleeping in the cold, right? But why is that what it takes? For us to really do something generally different. Yeah. What is decolonization? It's about tearing down our clothes and our investments in the cultural system, being naked with each other, and going to a car if you don't need to see But that kind of level of precarity and vulnerability, uh, uh, the rawness of it, is what I'm interested in. And how to invite people to see that in that rawness and vulnerability, there's a lot of strength and there are different forms of joy that we have forgotten, right? And different forms of joy that are new, that we haven't even discovered yet. How do we go there without instrumentalizing this process for something else? So that's another question. The third question is, how can we engage and be taught by different systems of knowledge and being Struggles in attempts to create alternatives, hugely, and there's a play with that word, aware of their gifts, limitations, ignorances, and contradictions. So, in Western thinking, and it is partly because of the alignment, partly not, we are taught to think in the dialectical way. And dialectics are reduced to give, but we are taught to uh, expect a synthesis or a replacement. So, if A is bad, the opposite being of the good, right? Or we expect a synthesis that brings the best of both worlds. What we are not to think, taught to think about is that A can be good and bad according to context, depending on several circumstances. It can be both a medicine and a poison. The same with B, right? It can be good and bad and a poison or a medicine. So how do we approach these different knowledge systems without this necessity to replace one thing for another, without romanticizing, essentializing, without victimizing, vilifying, so that we can see that there are gifts and problems in all knowledge systems, right? And we need to develop this criteria for wisdom, maybe, or uh, like what the Santos so, so, so talks about. Uh, he doesn't use sobriety, but I'm going to use it a, a little bit. What is the word that you use? Prudence. I think he uses prudent knowledge. It's a prudent approach to knowledge. But that needs to stop us from wanting to criticize something and have a quick replacement of it, right? Without thinking about the implications that of the complexity, the paradoxes of this process. My fourth question is how can we face and start to heal our collective pain without guilt, paralysis, Entitlement and drama. So that gets really on the way, especially in the kind of politics that we have to get to the politics of entitlement for access to the systems that we have, or it's like that we have to be claiming some kind of oppression to get some kind of benefit in the system or access or space, and that's perfectly fine, it's necessary, we have to do it. But that doesn't necessarily lead to healing, it leads to access. So how do we have access still, I think it's important, but also separate it from the healing that needs to start to happen. And this I have an example, my experience for example with the Canadian immigration system has been horrendous, absolutely horrendous. They have separated me from my family, they have hurt me in many different ways. But I remember having this dream uh, one, one day where I had this open room Right? So I was being thrown into a border, which was the Canadian border, which had uh, thin, um, wired fences, and I was being thrown into this border and being slashed, right? And I wanted Canadians to see my, my wounds, so that they would see that their security depends on that border. And they would stop saying that their Canada was great. That's what I wanted in my family. But uh, they wouldn't know who that. They would say, I'm sorry, but they wouldn't see the connection, right? 
Because I knew, like, what I wanted them to see was that this was happening to other people. And that this whole uh, exceptionalist narrative about Canada is extremely problematic. And that prevents us even from talking about it, right? So, my idea was that I have to show them if they don't see it, I have to keep the wound open. Otherwise, they betray the people who are going through it. So I think for a year and a half, I didn't want to heal because healing meant betraying the people who are still going through it. Then I had another dream, and the dream was that there was a song that entered my wounds. Don't ask me how. The song entered the wounds, and it got me dancing. And the dancing started to spark the wounds. And by starting the wounds, the Canadians who I wanted to see things, they started to be interested in what was going on. And I said, that's interesting. Now they are interested in seeing something, but not in the way that I wanted them to see. And suddenly they started to realize that dancing with the stars, not with the stars, would be important, right, in the system of starting that healing process. That I didn't have to keep myself, and I did for a year and a half, miserable. Right? In order to keep the wounds open, that I could have joy and I could dance together. And as I, in my dream, as I approached the Canadian who had refused to see it, I also saw that they had barbed wires inside, that they were also hurt. Right? Because the separation hurts everybody, it hurts all of us. And the dancing may have something to do with how we heal together. So that question is related to that dream. Number five. What can engender a stream of connections not dependent on convictions, knowledge, identity, or understanding? What can bring people together when they don't have anything story in common? So again, going back to the Enlightenment and the kinds of expectations we place upon knowledge. So the Enlightenment expectations are that knowledge can explain everything, knowledge can fix everything, knowledge can tell us who we are, Knowledge can mediate all of our relationships. This is interesting as an experiment, but these expectations are unrealistic. Right? We relate full stop. We don't need mediation of boxes and categories to relate to each other. So what, what happens when we start to only be able to relate through categories, through categories of thought? Right? This is a problem then that creates between us and others, and we can only then see ourselves as separate. From each other. And most of what we can see then is us in the other rather than us in the other. Right? So this is uh, another question that, that comes up. Question six What can activate a sense of care and commitment to everything that overrides self interest and categories of thought? So we've been thinking about conviction <coughs> and the things that mobilize us to act, which is a Cartesian assumption. And if that Cartesian assumption is not working, what good if it is not through us committing to a, a set of convictions and then changing our behavior, if that has proven not to work, what else would? So I'm looking at, uh, specifically for this question, at cultures that have practices of dissociation. Dissociation means cultures that uh, have embedded in their, their practice some time for nurturing a place where you are not your identity, where you take a step back and you see time very differently, where you see past, present, and future collapse in front of you, and you would sense yourself as part of something much bigger. But it is not a thinking process, it's not an intellectual process, it's a sensorial process. So most of these practices involve um, some sort of deprivation, like lack like of food, lack like of water, but it's not just for a day, it's like for four or five days without water or without food. Um, it involves, for example, people being buried in the sand only with their head up for nine to ten days or more. So this is the kind of thing that I'm talking about. And I'm thinking about how, uh, in like using even neuroscience, what parts of the brain that do these practices have uh, activate that our socialization in this kind of logic of uh, square logic of uh, 
schooling and society generally, which is uh, which are related to the prefrontal cortex of uh, self-management, self-authorship, and self-actualization, right? What what is it that we're missing out when we're not doing this other thing? Right? So that's question six. And question seven is. What do the stories we tell in our relationship to them have to do with all of this? I think stories are important, right? But they can't describe the world. The world doesn't speak any story. And they can't really construct the world, which is the constructionist idea. I think there's something about it there, but what else can we do? And what expectations can we place on knowledge, right, that are more realistic? So part of my work has been about this inquiry and pedagogy that is about the stories we tell, what we want them to do, what they show, what they hide, where they come from, where they lead us to, how they enable or constrain possibilities for coexistence and change. And the pedagogy is about opening our imaginaries for other possible ways to tell stories, other beginnings, other endings, other framing, other ways of knowing, being, relating, walking in non-coercive ways. So that you have the freedom to walk your journey with your story. Understanding you're not an individual, your stories are connected with mine. And you, you don't have the entitlement to, for that border. But how, how do we then walk together in this in a different way? So this involves hosting differently. Hosting ourselves, hosting each other hosting conflict in the face of complexity, uncertainty, ambivalence, asymmetry, vulnerability, incommensurability, with courage, humility, sobriety, discernment. discernment. I've been challenged on the sobriety thing because people really <laughs> like washing very much. So I'm saying now, by a medium, sobriety and discernment. So the idea here is that these things, courage, humility, and discernment, are not intellectual choices. Now we say, I'm going to be courageous. They are things that emanate from you, from another space of being, where you can, where generosity comes as a natural state. And trying to get there without just talking about it is one of the challenges, I think, uh, of this, this system of hosting. And what I do in my work is a lot of experimentation tools. And the idea of walking together differently in a foggy road has been a very important concept. Again, I've been challenged on the walking as an atheist concept. And I've been asked to keep it there so that I could tell the story of being challenged about the walking. And I've been using breathing together now. Not walking, but the walking is there so that I make a point that I'm learning. So breathing together differently in a foggy road means listening, engaging, tentatively framing, Failing, learning, reframing, singing, sharing, stumbling, making mistakes, listening, trying new clothes, getting naked, being undone, laughing, crying, feeling, dancing, resting, and starting it all over again. Here, if you're waiting for an, a process that has a, a beginning and an end, I can tell you from the outset, number one, you're going to be really frustrated. Number two, you're going to burn out very quickly. There's no A to B. This is going to be a long walk, right, process. And you're not going to see the end of it. Now, how we walk this in order to keep our sanity and our energy and our possibility for joy is also quite important, right? So if we change the idea that there is a teleological end to the idea that this is a lifelong, life-wide process that will require sometimes anger, for interruption of certain things, most of the time love, sometimes tough love, right? Sometimes giving space for other people to come up with what they need to come up with. It will require mistakes so that people can learn it, so that you can learn. If we're not, uh, if, we're, if we're not at peace with this process itself, what we're going to see is a lot of people um, exiting, leaving the system with uh, very little hope left or without any stamina, right, to continue or to support each other. In the communities that I, I, I practice uh, with, um, there is a very strong saying that 
Anger is very important for interrupting things, but you cannot build new things from it, right? It will only reproduce that which is in a position to. So one of the things that is really important is that uh, you need to be well in yourself, you need to be balanced, you need to be to, to have your own healing together if you want to offer something useful for your community. If you're not well, you're going to be reproducing, you're going to be projecting your delusion of what's wrong in the whole environment, and you're in balance in the whole environment. So it's very important in this process that we take care of ourselves and we take care of each other. Right? Understanding that imbalances in the in our team is gonna be imbalance work as a result. So um, I'm just going to shift to the frame that I've been using with people to, to talk about this work. I, I use a lot of the porn talks, but I'm a bit tired of them. So I've used now the um, abyss of Bonaventura de Sousa Santos. And Bonaventura talks about the, the idea of the abyss as um, there is a universalizing form of knowing that sees itself as an abyss. So what's at the top of the abyss is what's considered knowledge, reality, truth. And what's beyond that abyss is considered nothing or something of little value, because it's unintelligible to what is uh, on top of the plateau. And Gopin to the to suggest that it's not about what we don't imagine as an extension of our knowledge, but about what we cannot imagine from within our realms of intelligibility. So I'm taking it, uh, this question of intelligibility very seriously here, because what I've seen uh, over and over again in my practical translation is that from this globalized, universalized, imaginary, things only become uh, meaningful when they are brought up the plateau, rather than seen on its terms as something completely different that I can't understand. So because we have been socialized through only relating to what we can understand, we create a story about that which we don't like, and we include it in our own imaginary, and we think we got it, right? when actually it's something completely different. And then we say we're open, we say we got it, when this is not actually happening. And I see some people who usually think, uh, you're here for five minutes, and you say you, you, you know everything, when we've been here for millennia, and we ourselves don't understand it, right? It's not about understanding. So I think this is very useful in terms of talking about a pedagogical process that takes people to the edge, that invites people to the edge of that abyss to the limits of our knowledge system, to the limits of our systems of intelligibility, to the discomfort that happens in that space, so that we can open up a tiny possibility of hearing something different, of receiving a different invitation, to reason with more senses, right? To have more, um, to have some sort of experience of understanding that doesn't depend on the intellect, for example. So I think this is a very important metaphor and through that metaphor, uh, I looked at forms of engagement between those at the plateau and those outside of the plateau, and the kind of patterns that you see when we want to help others become part and included in our context. This one is more about people helping, generally schools, the came from work of schools trying to help uh, communities that are economically disadvantaged. And I've seen that past, this patterns form the acronym heads up. So the first pattern is hegemonic. These engagements are generally hegemonic. <coughs> they bring force or justify the status quo. They're ethnocentric. They project one view as universal. They are ahistorical. They forget historical legacies and complicities. They are depoliticized. They disregard power inequalities and ideologies. They are salvationist, self-serving, and self-congratulatory. They invest in self-congratulatory heroism. They are uncomplicated. They offer few good quick fixes. And they are paternalistic, waiting for a thank you at the end of the intervention. So it's very difficult to challenge all of these things at the same time, because these are part of and very much tied to the frames of reference of that universal imaginary. So I've seen people trying to say, OK, we're not going to do any of that and then become completely unintelligible, right? So this is not a checklist of things that, okay, I don't want to do that. We do it, whether we like it or not. 
right? Or all because we're socialized into it. So finding a way of generously and with a lot of self self compassion, walking through the process of undoing this thing is very, very, very difficult. But it's also very, very, very necessary. And also paying attention to what happens when you try to do it too quickly. For example, people challenging hegemonic ways of being invariably, I think, end up uh, in one way or the other creating a new hegemony, right? <laughs> and if you're challenging ethnocentrism, then very often we, we fall back in for uh, ethnocentrism, which is also extremely problematic. So how do we see the how, how can we create an approach that we are aware and ready to face the problems that our solutions engender, right? When we're trying to address these things, and we don't think that we tick the box, we got it, and we're doing what what we're doing is right. So that's one. There's also work on inclusion, which I think is very relevant for decolonization, and this is these are in between this around political and existential questions that we're talking about. And this is based on the work of Sarah Ahmed. I really recommend the book on being included. Uh, she is a gifted writer in that sense, in terms of naming all the problems with inclusion in higher education. Very useful for teacher attitude. So the first thing that she, she doesn't use the word that I'm going to put here. It's based on her work, but it's very useful, I think, what she does. She talks about tokenization and the inclusion where you are brought here so that business can go on as usual. And the bodies are counted, but nothing changes, right? In the display, you should be available for an equity photograph, right? Because of that body. There's that. You have your place, you should be grateful for it, right? And if you're not, we're going to find somebody who is. Burden, your job is to meet the needs of everybody, right? Very different from other people. Your colleagues sometimes have only to meet the needs of the people they have they, they work with, but your job is to meet the needs of everybody. And the, the amount of work, extra work you have to do is unbelievable. But nobody sees it too because it's invisibilized. The trap, if you articulate a problem, you become the problem because you're already here, right? So I can ask another day, the next you've been talking about this thing, but you're speaking, right? You're here. We've done it. Uh, and that's why, why are you? You're poking on it. And it's very difficult to res respond to that if uh, the job is perceived just to be allowing me to speak. Right? That is, that is very problematic. Then there is the betrayal and the cost, which means that your investment must align with ours. So I'm in a project of, um, on Indigenous education in Canada where we're looking at it. And what is interesting is like uh, we're looking at it through the lens of representation, recognition, and redistribution. So it's like there's a table, and if it is about recognition, you're given a, a space at the table. I'm uh, sorry, re representation. You're given a space at the table, at the table, and because you're there, things are okay. You can go on and do whatever you want to do. Recognition is that you, you're given a space at the table, and you are asked to talk about the violence that was done against you. And then people nod and say, yes, we've heard it now, and then business will go as usual. Right? But we are ticking the box. In redistribution, you're given some money. Right? And now you have some money, you are at the table, you have a platform and some money. Shouldn't you be grateful about this? But we decide where forward is. Right? The business still goes on as usual. There is redistribution, and if you don't align with it, we will find somebody else with it. And in the project that we're talking about, the business as usual is education and social mobility, education for social mobility. So anybody proposing an anti-capitalist form of education is substituted at the table. So they get another indigenous person who would agree with the social uh, mobility agenda. And that's something we need to talk about, because that's not necessarily what inclusion, uh, or not completely the potential that inclusion could have. So, part of the issue is how do we put these things on the table without um, the heavy emotional charge that we do have for the people who are going through this process? Imagine yourself to be in the position of the person who is brought to the table. And all the time, what you're trying to do, which is to change the forward, 
you are met with all these different obstacles, and people are happy because you're included, right? And they're celebrating that and just putting you in the photograph. Imagine the level of frustration. So when you talk about it, uh, sometimes it is with anger. It is with a deep level of depression even about being in the system. And a lot of, of our problems of retention of people who have uh, to go through this process is because of burnout in this process, right? So how do we, can we talk about it? We can support uh, in solidarity uh, with, with, with people who are being brought to the inclusion thing on other people's terms. How can we talk about it without the emotional charge that actually sometimes paralyzes the discussion and, that, and it prevents us from finding creative small step uh, processes that can, can at least mitigate some of the negative effects that this process is having on Ah, there's one more. The help. <laughs> Your body is an extension of our entitlement. So this is interesting. Because especially in the neoliberal university where you are in a kind of a supermarket of credentials and students come to you for that stamp of approval or that piece of paper, uh, diversity now has become, in a way, also a niche market, right? Where we are also seen as a product, a product to be consumed for self-actualization of another. So it's an entitlement for that self-actualization. In fact, it's that neoliberalism that is allowing us to be there. Right? So it's not an easy relationship here between those who are included and uh, in the space that's open for us to be there. But it's something that we need to talk about, I think. So this is the thing that uh, uh, it's a frame about social change, and I'm going to finish there so that we can open up for discussion. <coughs> Related to four, four, it's four actually, not but. Here we have three different um, possibilities of thinking about institutional change. That's why I put that slide there. And this came from actually my students looking at how um, they were writing these articles, but they knew that each journal had already some frame of what was possible to be said, right? What was possible to be, to be discussed. And what they wanted to map how the different journals would receive their arguments. So they map the space called soft reform, which is this idea that uh, change means making the same world a little bit better through personal transformation and individual action. So the whole idea is to make a difference by changing individuals and changing policies. The analysis are very superficial, they're individually focused, the single story of progress development and human evolution is there, it's all about social mobility, uh, there are simplistic solutions, it's uh, very self-affirming, lots of comfort, same questions, same answers. And when we were looking at articles about decolonization, in this space here, decolonization doesn't make much sense because the system is kind of good, right? We just need to fix it a little bit. Decolonization starts to make sense when there is a recognition of epistemological hegemony. Then decolonization becomes, because then you, you realize there's a single story, and that single story is problematic. So the first uh, way to look at it is to think about radical reform. To make the same world a lot better by including more people, more voices and perspectives in collective action. Rethink, include. Here we have systemic and historical analysis much further. Uh, multiple perspectives, self-implicating analysis, complex, more complex solutions and a lot of discomfort. And the idea is to be comfortable with discomfort. Here we have same questions and different answers. But we also mapped another space after the recognition of ontological hegemony. And so epistemological is a hegemony of ways of knowing, the same story. If ontological is about ways of being, right? So it goes beyond just knowledge production. And here the space that we mapped was a space called beyond reform. So the idea is that the system is not fixable, and uh, the, the trust here is to disinvest it in the current unsustainable world and to walk with others into the possibility of new worlds. Here it's about imagining the impossible. Here we have systemic and historical analysis a step further, because we realize the false promises and contradiction of uh, modern subjectivities of modern systems. And there's an undoing of the modern structure, or an attempt at undoing the modern structure of being. 
Here we have different questions and different answers. In this, um, in this cartography here, I've been working a lot with radical reform and the on reform, and I think both of them are important. Is there not, uh, this is right, this is wrong? Probably in the morning, in one day, I could be talking to the soft reform people, then radical reform, and you have to switch, right? And then the on reform in the evening. <laughs> and we don't have places to debrief, and that's probably what's causing a lot of frustration. And, um, but the usefulness of the map is to see what are the contradictions in all of that. Because even in the Beyond Reform, if you look at uh, initiatives like transition towns, permaculture, biodynamics, uh, people who are walking out from the system trying to create alternative communities, be it based on spirituality or politics or um, education, <coughs> the unschooling, this schooling movement, they're doing something extremely important in this walking out. Uh, they are also getting caught in this uh, shift, and it's the flip of the paradigm. So I don't like the elitism of the university, therefore knowledge of the people should be the answer, right? So you get caught in uh, two different, in different dogmatism. It is problematic, but they are also experimenting with new things. And I think it's their failure that is actually the fertilizer for something new to be born. So I think working with this community is trying to shift uh, understanding from wanting success straight away and outcomes straight away and placing all your expectations or affirmation and validation on the outcomes to the idea of walking together, breathing together, and really paying attention to the complexities, the paradoxes, and the failures on the way so that that learning will help future generations to do something generally different when the time comes. Because there's also a, a, a readiness um, a readiness element to all of this. Ah, sorry, <laughs> to the next slide. But um, thinking about it from a Brazilian, there's a Brazilian slogan. So working with this community has been very inspiring, actually, because they are not invested in, in changing schools or teacher education. They are saying we need completely new systems, and we're going to start from scratch. They never start from scratch. They always start from the old, or the opposite of the old, or something like that. But um, there is a very strong um, sense that something very different is possible. And they're trying to tap and to touch that. So I think I, I feel inspired by that. I know that the walk towards that is, is very complicated. What is the big oh, I, I said, and there's a sense of readiness too. So in Brazil, they have, they have this proverb that says, in the situation of flood, when the, when the water is at your painful, you can still walk, and you will keep walking because that's, that's the only thing you can do. When the water reaches your knee, it's more difficult to walk, but you still walk because that's the only thing you can do. It's only when the water reaches your hip that you start swimming because swimming is easier than walking in that circumstance, right? So what I see in this community, in the Beyond Reform uh, space, with all its contradictions, is that they are trying to swim because the water for them has reached uh, the, the hip, right? For some, it's probably still here. They're trying, and they're not probably uh, getting very far too because of that. But for me, if you look at the unsustainability of our system, the water is rising. It is real rise. This is not going to continue forever. Unending growth and consumption does not acknowledge the biophysical limits of the planet or the externalized costs of what we have today. There are human costs, there are environmental costs. You can't keep doing what you're doing. The water is going to come to the different point. So what these people were doing, indigenous communities and other communities of struggle have been doing forever, was to find different ways of, of navigating this in the water. And we will need to learn to swim. And maybe they can teach us a few techniques. But they will not be able to teach us everything because our rivers right, are going to be different from their rivers rising. So we have to approach them not as a replacement to our struggle, but as something that can inspire us to go deeper in the questions that we ask about what we are doing. And that is something that our schools and our universities and our teacher education doesn't teach us to do. It teaches us to look for a semi certainty in some kind of answer. And unless we shift our relationship to this semi certainty towards the process of reflexivity and then openness, 
We're going to keep repeating the same mistakes and thinking we're doing something new when we're not. Right? So, in order to finish, uh, I'll just finish with your care. This is the framework that I've been working with a group of dissenters in the on the farm space, and I'll finish with that. We're trying to put together, so the research behind it is that uh, in visiting the centers, people are looking at justice only looking at a, a fraction of the system that they don't like and they respond to that. And then you have somebody who is, if you look at it as a monster, somebody, somebody is touching the toe, others are touching the hand, and we are part of the monster as well. So here is trying to create a framework that brings these different knowledges together. And we're talking about um, an approach to justice that is six-pronged. So we're talking about ecological justice, cognitive justice, affective justice, relational justice, economic justice, and intergenerational justice. And trying to see if it's an integrative approach, and justice is a complicated and problematic concept too, right? To not uh, allowing the different aspects fall from the agenda, fall off the table. So how do we develop inquiries about each one of them in ways that go in depth into each of the of, of the types of monster that they're trying to, to address, but that do not lose the connection with the other parts. Right? How do we create spaces where we can share learning and share the insights or what we learned from the failures that we've had in our different experiments in these areas. And I think I needed to to leave it it is there because this is a new project I'm excited about <laughs> and um, still thinking about it. So some feedback on the integrative justice framework would also be useful for the communities that I'm working with. And I will take that back. Thank you. Okay, so when, when we um, enter into something, we have to know about the cost to ourselves. And since a lot of what you were talking about is about the embodied experience of approaching something, um, I wonder, have you thought about the cost that we incur to ourselves and to others um, as part of that approach? I think whenever we are entering a relationship, it is an embodied experience, whether we acknowledge it or not, and the costs are there, whether we acknowledge it or not. It's just how we register it or decide not to. I think I've thought of, about it in terms of our fears of being undone by the experience or being affected by others, and how do we reduce the fear and the barrier? And this fear comes probably from a very socialized uh, fear of pain. Right? We, we don't want to feel the pain, and then we numb to it. But actually, we do feel it. We can't help but feel it if we are not separated. Right? So if we come from that paradigm that you are in me, uh, my responsibility is very different. I cannot just simply say I'm not interfering with your, your journey because we are already in connection and in conversation. What I can do, though, in terms of uh, reducing this fear, is to remind both of us that uh, the fear comes from the understanding that our hearts are too small because they are individualized. But if I can communicate to you or make you sensible uh, of what <laughs> that our hearts are connected to, and we can take it, right? We can take anything. Our pain is never bigger than our collective hearts in that sense. And it's a matter of scaling up that has to consent to people to be and to learn and to make mistakes, and ourselves too, that they need to make in a relationship. And finding the language where that can be at the table, and when we're not uh, creating other narratives that mask that, right?
right? That high that we're already aching, right? We're already in pain. We're already broken. And if we don't talk about this pain, we can't heal. So are you saying the cost itself is a form of socialized intelligibility of the sense? <sighs> intelligibility in the sense of in the sensorial sense, yes. Not necessarily in the logical sense. It can be metaphoric, right? So the intelligibility is about um, sensorially understanding that, <laughs> sensorially reasoning that um, we are already paying the cost, right? Rising levels of anxiety, depression, self-harm, and suicide amongst young people, right, would be the first thing that I would put as a flag. Right? And I, would, I always say, there's this conversation I had in Vancouver um, when trying to prevent a chain of suicide in a school, when uh, we asked people, like, what, what do you want to talk about? And they were, like, not wanting to respond. And then I said, okay, so can you tell me about the pain that you're feeling right now, that space where you're, you're considering taking your life? Uh, because you're, and then they said, one of them said, it's like a phantom limb thing that people tell you it's not there, but it is. And then you feel guilty because people tell you it's not there, you have everything, you shouldn't be feeling that thing, kind of thing, right? And that creates more pain, right? And then, and then they say, and then you go to the psychiatrist and it gives you a pill to numb that thing. And I said, okay, so you're coming from a paradigm that says we are individuals, and separated, right? And we are just this body. Uh, with a temporality in that we need to avoid pain and avoid death if possible. If we're afraid of those things. Uh, what about another paradigm that says that if people are dying in Syria, you are feeling it here, right? And you're just not acknowledging it. If people are suffering in Palestine, you are feeling it here. If the earth is suffering, you are feeling it here. Does that help? They said yes, because it names it. Right? It allows you a story that names that pain. It doesn't solve the pain, but it allows it to be visible. So a lot of them, one of them um, compared it to the self-harm, to the cutting, right? Making the pain visible is the first step. Naming it is the first step for it to heal. You, you might still want to keep it open, but if you, even the, if you can't see it, if you're numb to it, it appears somewhere else in your life in any case. So instead of calculating costs as, okay, now I'm going to intervene and I'm going to calculate the cost, I prefer to go from a paradigm where we are already aching, right? It, and it's a matter of activating the senses that recognize that rather than uh, investing again in this Cartesian thing about utility maximizing, uh, morally based intervention where you are kind of trying to control how we bump into each other. We bump, right? Because we are meant to. We're meant to be interwoven with each other. And yes, it needs some kind of ethics of normativity. But the normativity is a grounded one, uh, as Glenn Coutard talks about, rather than a Cartesian one that tries to control or calculate or maximize utility. Even if it's coming from a caring perspective, which I think it is, it is the question comes from that. There are things we can do through reason, but there intellectual reasons, and there are things that are beyond that, right? And then putting that as part of the equation together with all these other senses and the acknowledgement that collectively we are aging and we are broken is part of the answer that we have. What I have said is when it's done with my own experience working with working with a uh, refugee community and Bristol and working with diaspora back we are in diaspora so we're working with experience, you know, on the front of the line. And what you said like we don't want to heal because we feel betrayal. And and I find it difficult how to communicate with people up here in the diaspora with people on the front line. So that's strategy I'm doing, for example. Not to talk about work, so show them there is normality. But sometimes when you do this, like yesterday, I was told you are too relaxed. You don't feel what we are going 
you know, it's true. And if you can tell them that you know what they are going through, they would say, stop being depressed, we don't want to talk about this. <laughs> so it's, it's really hard, yeah, to, to have to communicate with people in the desert or about to engage with them and, and the ethics around that. So I speak, for example, with Serge and my sister, you know, and I just want to them who are under bombing and it's hard, you know, try to, to bring your up not to talk and then they think you are out of touch with reality. Although you don't want to, to increase their anxiety. Another thing about understanding people's pain is very important. And uh, what causes the pain? Uh, because understanding what causes the pain so that you don't you don't become a reason for causing the pain is very important. And this is really hard to make interpreters and social workers sometimes understand. For example, someone I work with feels phobia from social workers, thinks that they're gonna harm her. And I like because we are we share the culture, I make her feel at peace that no social worker in the UK is gonna harm her her children. But the problem with the social worker can't understand that she's given you know authority for this person and our people have fear of authority. So if you distance me, for example, and I make her understand that culturally here no social worker will hurt you, and the social worker comes and distance me, you become too close to the customer, you know, a kind of power relation is that. So one thing like what activate pain and avoiding being the, the reason that to activate, to activate a trauma memory for a person and how, how to deal with and build this relationship is really all the same on language. Sometimes you might say something you want to help, but you cause the person an anxiety. A social worker might say something that she wants, you know, the she wants good for that person, but that person, you know, in in that receive it like it's in a, in a, in a, it's a social worker saying in a harsh way, you know, it gives a negative impact. Like when your mom screams at you because you want something, but you take it, you know, in a, in a negative. So this is, yeah, my main question, how to communicate with students that they support us and show that engagement. I'm not walking with you in a foggy, I'm walking with you in a over landmine. But thank you. Yeah. Thank you for the metaphor. The landmine one, especially in your context, is actually perfect. Because re-traumatization is just one step away. Yeah, I think when you're inside, they don't understand that you here can be traumatized as well. I think a surgeon who, for example, one of the surgeons who from America and was inside, he said, when you are on the ground, you are very strong. When I leave and go to America, then I become more traumatized than inside because I'm watching from far. While like inside, you are strong because you are working on it. Yes, it's really like very complex. <laughs> and you are in a very similar position of translation then. How yeah. do you tell this community that this is hurting that they can't even see or understand what's happening? There are no easy answers in yeah. I think we're learning as we go along. Uh, the only thing that it reminded me of in one of the practices um, that I take part, uh, it's about giving the pain without narrativizing it. Right? So the the our way, our modern mainstream way of dealing with things is talking me through, but actually sometimes we, that that can't work, that doesn't work, right? So bringing pain and, and dealing with it collectively through sound, through dreaming, through metaphor, or what we would call here art, right? Um, are other possibilities, or just the release, cathartic release, having space for cathartic release, which we don't have anymore. What the guys are doing in the UK, instead of talking about what happened, teaching the person technique when they remember something that happened, to focus on the present. And try to name things around them or feel sounds that they can see. So this is, this is the technique that they do. And yeah, instead of making them talk about something. Because there is an area in the brain, the alarm system in the brain, you know, when you when you say that narrative of, of, of bad stories, you know, your alarm system doesn't know that you are not in danger. So that's why it keeps triggering it. To so teach to teach your alarm system in the brain to put things in the past, you know, focus on the present, what you what is around you.